South Avenue Baptist Church, where we're devoted to the Word of God and to the knowledge and the worship of our precious Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. That the world may know Him, and that where we just love to get together and shout out to Him, Praise the Lord! We got so many, but we know how to lift it up to the Lord. That's great. Um, announcements are pretty much laid out in the bulletin. Uh, most of you have already heard Marty's mother has passed away. Um, the last we have heard that she was doing a little better and things didn't go right. But, so uh, prayers for Marty, please, and the rest of his family. Uh, you already know, I'm sure, that the Bible study class will be starting again on Sunday, September 6th up in the lobby of the auditorium. And I'm looking forward to that. Uh, there's a church board meeting Sunday, September 13th, right after Sunday service. September 13th. Pastor? Yes. I did put that with you. Well, they came up, but I want you to pray for God's guidance in our service. Okay. In just a moment. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is the time that I would like Marty Ayers to come and share uh, what he is going to be sharing at the memorial service for his mother. And uh, Marty, this is the time for you to lead us in this moment of reflection upon your wonderful, God fearing. Mother. Come on up, brother. Amen. <laughs>
that exalt Christ, that exalt and acknowledge his suffering and his someday rule and reign over us all. But now, he is the Messiah, and I'm going to point to some verses in this passage that are the core of what a person must come to believe. One or the other of these phrases, and the truth behind the phrase, here we go, beginning at verse 35, John chapter 1. Again the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. That's John the Baptist, you know. And looking at Jesus as he walked, what was he doing? He was looking at Jesus as he walked. He said, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Wow. That's something you could believe and have everlasting life if you understand what it means to be the Lamb of God. Right there, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, see he has sight too, of a deeper kind, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, where are you abiding? Where are you staying? Next. He said to them, Come and see. <laughs> he can see. He invites us to come to him and to see where he hangs out, like with his father, really, spiritually speaking. They came and saw where he was abiding, staying, hanging out, and abided or remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. That'd be about uh, four o'clock in the afternoon, tea time, whatever. One of the two who heard John speak, you know, who said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Simon's the famous one. Simon Peter's the famous one. Andrew's the one that brought his brother to Jesus. He first found his own brother, Simon, and, uh, Simon Peter, and said to him, we have found the Messiah. Did you know uh, which translated is into Greek, the Christ, from Hebrew Messiah to... Yeah. Uh, just one, one more. Go back to that, David, so that we can... I know that I'm supposed to be reading, but i got I got to comment on this. This phrase, we have found the Messiah, when understood in its true sense, is... We found the one of whom Old Testament prophets spoke, who will be the King of Israel, who is the Christ. The one who gives life to the dead. When a person believes any of these phrases with that kind of understanding, they become a child of God. Next, David. And he brought him to Jesus. Andrew brought Peter to Jesus. Now, when Jesus looked, Jesus sees at him, he can look beyond the present to the future, Jesus can. And he said, you're Simon, the son of Jonah. Simon was kind of like his Hebrew name. You shall be called Kephas, which is the Aramaic word. When translated, is what Greek calls a stone or Petros. Jesus sees where things are headed. He knows where things have been. 
and he sees what is to come. Peter shall be called a stone. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda, or Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Next. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote. There's another person who gets eternal life when he believes that Jesus is the one of whom Moses in the law and also in the prophets wrote. And of course his name as a man, the son of man, is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He became one of us that he might lead many sons to glory, Hebrews will tell us. And Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because uh, he hadn't uh, been convinced yet that this was the Messiah. Philip said to him, you do some coming and some seeing. Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him. Jesus does the seeing first and knows what's about to happen and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Next. I like to say that, David, you're great. Thank you. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me. Jesus answered and said to him, you know, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, Jesus wasn't necessarily there physically, but he saw all that was going on. He could see things. Not just dead people, but he could <laughs> see things. <laughs> Some of you know what that means. Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. Did you know that when a person believes that Jesus is the Son of God, if they understand rightly that that is the one who gives eternal life to all who believe in him for it, they have eternal life. And what else did he say? You are the King of Israel. Well, Jesus is the King of Israel, but he does not yet sit upon the ultimate throne of victory on earth, having dominion over the earth, or the people of the earth. But, just a second, David. I appreciate your patience with me, David. There we are. You are the King of Israel. When a person believes that Jesus is the King of Israel, who will sit upon the throne of uh, this planet under the authority of his Father in heaven who is going to come and reign on earth but who now is a, uh, given a position of being a little lower than the angels before he went up to sit at the Father's hand. When a person believes that Jesus is the King of Israel the one who gives life to those who believe in him for it, that's exactly what that person has. Everlasting life. And that, we have two more verses, I think. Next. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? Is it for that reason? And he would have said, and that's good, that brings life to you. You become a child of God that way to as many as received Him. But, he says, you will see greater things than these. Did you know that children have something greater to look forward to than always being a child of God? What they have to look forward to is being a son of God. And the captain of our salvation is going to bring many sons to glory, friends. And so, Jesus answered and said, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? That's good. You will see greater things than these, as 
sons being brought to glory. And he said to him, Jesus said to Nathanael, Most assuredly I say to you, verily, verily, certainly, certainly, most assuredly I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. When you believe that Jesus is the Son of Man, in the biblical sense, you have life everlasting. These things are significant in the Gospel of John as a forerunner to the call to discipleship, which is the focus of the imagery on the front of your bulletin today, and which is at the heart of becoming as a child of God, becoming a son or a daughter of the living God in the world to come, of which we will speak from Hebrews chapter 2 today. Suffering now, reigning with the King someday. Let us sing about what a friend we have in Jesus. And the two songs that follow, I'll introduce also. Lyndon? Okay. Brandon Jesus, what a friend. <clears throat>
But he was under some captains and some generals, ultimately. And he learned obedience through the things which he suffered as a soldier of the, of the U.S. Army. Okay? But he always knew that he needed to follow his captain and whoever else was above him. And so we are invited to follow Jesus, the captain, sometimes called the author and finish of our faith, but he's the leader and the one who brings to completion that which he is leading us to, sons of glory. Okay, so as you sing this song, ask yourself, am I drifting away or am I becoming a soldier of the cross. It's a mission. It's not a once for all completed action as the, the grammarians like to say about certain kind of verb. It is a process and let us enter into this and continually ask ourselves, am I becoming a soldier of the cross daily in my life together with the captain of our faith even Jesus Christ our Lord. And the last verse is always the victory shout. Lyndon, take us into it.
2. Only part, partly reading through this psalm. Why do the nations rage? And the people plot a vain thing. That's going on in our world today, isn't it? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together. You know, the deep state in our country, <laughs> known as Washington, D.C. And what are they doing but exalting themselves? And when they do so, it is against the Lord and against his anointed, that is, his Messiah, the one who gives life to those who believe in him for it, against Yahweh and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Let's be independent. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. Yahweh shall hold them in derision. We are all accountable, the believers and the unbelievers, to the God with whom we have to do. There is just recompense for all that we ever do or say. Next. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath. That's what's really going to come during the seven-year tribulation. And distress them in his deep displeasure. He will distress them in his disple displeasure of them. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. You see, God is saying that before it actually comes to pass someday on earth. I will declare the decree. Yahweh has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. That's the Messiah. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. The Father says it to the Son, and the Son says it to us, us fellow humans, together with Jesus, he will give us, under Christ, the nations as an inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Jesus' is possession and under him, us. We are, when it says the King of kings and the Lord of lords, we are the kings and the lords under the King of kings and under the Lord of Lords. But we shall, if we persevere, and if we do not drift away. Amen. You shall break them with a rod of iron, you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. If you look at the end of the book of Revelation, chapter, not at the end of the book, but at the end of chapter 2 or 3, or both, the end of those chapters, it says, just as the Father has said to the Son that you will break them with a rod of iron, so the Son says to his overcomers in that passage, that we also, if we overcome and don't drift away, will have victory and bear the rod of iron to dash to pieces. When you see in Revelation 19 the Messiah on a horse coming back, guess who's with him? His Holy One. He is not alone in this future victorious reign over earth. He will be with each and every one of us but in particular, those who have suffered together with him. <laughs> Carried our cross and not walked the other direction. All right? Woo! And we now sing Faith 
of our fathers. Now, we go ahead, uh, just in a second, we'll say faith of our fathers. But this is not talking about the apostolic fathers, that is to say the patristic fathers, the one who in, ones who in the second and third and fourth century got all twisted off base like Origen and some of the others. We are talking about each and every believer written about in the Bible or not who suffered for the cause of God and could see where history was headed and knew where history had been. Let me give you an example. I mean, I'm mixing my message together with the rest of this service so it feels like a whole thing, okay? But let me tell you, a, a month ago, I was out on the waters of Grays Harbor, just as I was yesterday. But a month ago, we took the boat with one set of grandkids and my uh, son Aaron up to Friends Landing and had a wonderful picnic and then we boated back to 28th Street Ramp, okay? Yesterday we had the wisdom to take the boat out up there. You know why? Because I realized there were some difficult afternoon winds that makes this segment, especially from the bridge down to the 28th Street landing, quite a choppy sea. And a month ago, when we came down through there, the bow of the boat dipped one. We were, we were in the process of changing to me as the boat driver because the going had got a little tough and I uh, didn't want my daughter-in-law to be at the helm during the, the winds that I sensed we were facing and I would be docking the boat anyway when we got to the 28th Street landing. But when we were in the process of transitioning from one boat driver to the other called, uh, that is when we faced the worst wave that I've experienced in a long time in our boat. And the bow of the boat dipped the lowest into the water that, it, that I can remember it ever dipping. It didn't take water over the front. But you know why we were about, we could have capsized if I had driven carelessly, I think. I don't think that was going to happen because I, I, I've learned enough about driving my boat <laughs> to know that when the rough seas hit, you head straight into the wave. You don't go parallel to the wave and get tossed that way. And worst of all, you don't just sit still and let the winds cause you to do what? Drift away. And in Hebrews chapter 2, you're going to see a verse that says, Beware, lest any of you drift away. Hmm. Where are we? Uh, uh, we are about uh, ready to sing the song. Oh, you want to do a pastoral prayer? Yeah, I want to do that. That's what it now, I attempted this last week, and I, I made a little boo-boo doing it. But today, David, I want you to turn back, because I want to talk to you who are watching my video, whether it's this camera or that camera, or one of the two. And I want to talk and pray for you all who are listed in our bulletin but can't be here. Yeah. Let's see. Let's say I stand about where I did a week or so ago. I got my mask on. And uh, in the bulletin are listed several people. And those who get sent this message will see in the bulletin. Hopefully you'll see your name. And if you're one of the ones who uh, wants to be included in this list as people who for good, honest reasons, are unable to come because of health concerns, I want you to know that you are every much a part of us as those who are gathered here in socially distanced positions around the room. And I'll distance myself a little more to be safe here. Okay. So we are now going to pray for you and for us that we might be one and that we might experience being brought to glory together. 
by the captain of our faith, the author of our salvation, the beginning and the end, Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega. Let's pray. God in heaven, I thank you. I, I'd love to just mention all these names, but I'm not going to because I just want them to, I want anyone to include themselves in this expression of the body of Christ, whether they're viewing it online or viewing it uh, on a DVD of this service or sitting right here in this room. I want to pray for us as a community of believers in the captain of our faith and great salvation that we will be together brought to glory as sons not just children but sons who have responded to the discipline that God provides and that we would look unto the captain of our faith and the one who brings us to completion sons to glory we would look to him and depend upon him to guide us and lead us. And surely as I led some of my family members to the 28th Street Dump. Lord, glorify yourself through the fellowship known as South Aberdeen Baptist Church. Corporately, but each one individually. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 The faith of our brothers. Yes. Those who have followed God faithfully, whether they're written about or not. Faith of our fathers. Spirit. <laughs>
Good, good, good. Oh, you know, when we're singing that song, and now I will remove my mask and behind the magic shield. The magic screen. Yeah, man, man in the iron mask, not quite. My hearing aid stayed on while I took off my mask. By the way, if you wear hearing aids and you notice that masks tend to cause your hearing aids to fall off, have I got something for you? I, I don't have it yet, but it's, I mean, I have my own, but I don't have one for you all yet. But it's kind of like a little thing we connect to our hearing aids that goes back, a, a little baby rope that clips onto our collar. So that if we take our mask off and our hearing aid falls off, it doesn't go down the drain or into the Grays Harbor or wherever we find ourselves. I wore it yesterday on the boat cruise. <laughs> but Faith of Our Fathers, that song, I used to think about, oh, what great faith they had. And you know what? When I sing that song and it talks about the faith, I realize it's not so much focused on the fact that some of our spiritual fathers believe uh, or had a capacity to believe, but that it is what they believe in. When we refer to the Christian faith, we are talking about that body of truth that our faithful fathers believed in, that carried them through so that they didn't just become children of God to those who believe in his name, <clears throat> but they might be among the many sons whom the captain of our faith wants to bring to glory. We're going to look at least at the first few verses of the book of Hebrews chapter 2. And you will, by the way, find verses 1 through 5 in your bulletin if you don't have quick access to your Bible, but it'll be on the screen also. And I've emphasized three phrases in this verses 1 through 5, lest we drift away. And then in verse, that's in verse 1, and in verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That used to scare me that I was going to go to hell because I wasn't sure if I would escape. And I realize now that what we might, uh, what we are in need of escaping is the tendency of believers to do what verse 1 talks about, drifting away, lest we drift away like the boat squandering uh, out there in the middle of Gray's Harbor in a windstorm. We need to get the engine going and we need to head right into the waves, friends. And let's don't skip out on the opportunity to be led to glory triumphantly and not in defeat, which God's children are all capable of doing. We have choices to make, and it will be those who remain faithful, steadfast, and enduring <clears throat> until death comes, until death do us part, <laughs> you know, or Christ comes back and we're raptured and caught up together to be with him in the air, okay? How shall we escape drifting away if we neglect so great salvation? The great salvation isn't that we just that we have been saved from the penalty of sin and we're going to go to heaven when we die to be with Jesus, which we will. But that we might more than that, this great salvation, you know, an organ has a rank called the great rank or the, the, the one that plays all the breadth of the full organ. And friends, and Pat, God bless you, we love you, and so glad you could even stop by and you shared with me you have business to take care of that I think is wonderful. 
God bless you, Kat. Yes. <clears throat> this great salvation is a salvation which can be neglected and from which we can drift. And he does not want us to drift away from this great salvation, not just deliverance, salvation from the penalty of sin, but from the power of sin as we oppose it and as we stand up and suffer for the cross of Christ and shall someday rule and reign if we don't drift away. We'll be there as children who didn't respond to the child training of God, the paiduo, the, the discipline of the Lord. Let's respond to the discipline of the Lord, friends, that we might escape drifting away from this really, really great show. <laughs> really big show. Shoo. Where we this, that before? <laughs> I, I know. You know that created an image in the minds of those who can remember Yes, sir. And so <laughs> Jacob. So great a salvation which we have, brothers and sisters. Verse 3. How shall we escape drifting away if we neglect so great a really big shoot? So great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. He's the one that said, uh, if you would come after me, if you'd follow me, then deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. Enter into the sufferings like Jesus suffered, for instance, in the Garden of Gethsemane, that we might join him at the garden tomb at the point of resurrection like those sweet followers of Jesus. First and foremost was Mary Magdalene coming to the garden tomb alone and being the first one to meet up with the Savior, the Lord Jesus, in the garden tomb, at the garden tomb. Let us move beyond the garden of Gethsemane in our life to where Jesus went, it, to the garden tomb from whence came life, life everlasting, Jesus, alive from the dead, and taking with him you see, we're looking at the ultimate possibilities here, not just can you squeak out of hell into heaven. That's what we want to believe in and practice according to the faith of our faithful fathers who heard the promises of God and were willing, Hebrews 11 will say, to be sawn asunder, cut in half for the name of Jesus whom we follow. And the last phrase I've highlighted in your bulletin, which is at verse 5 in Hebrews 2. Well, I'll put it at the bottom of the screen so you can be seeing the other, three, other two phrases that I've emphasized. Lest we drift away, escape. In verse 5, for he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. He'll go on to explain, based on Psalm 8, which we have had as our scripture reading a week ago, he will not put that world to come. I could get out my pointer again, but I can point to has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. Oh, what a pity. No, in fact, the angels are delighted to participate in what God has planned. But who has he put the world to come into subjection? And we're talking about a vision of the future here. We're not talking about today. You know, Christ's kingdom hasn't come like so many like to teach today. It will be coming. But the world to come of which we speak is not going to be in subjection to angels, but to the many sons whom the captain of our faith will lead to glory. 
and he bases his argument on Psalm chapter two, uh, chapter eight, where it says, "But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him?' The psalmist in Psalm eight, or the son of man that you take care of him." an intimation or a hint of Jesus, the Messiah, who would come. Man and the Son of Man, you know, we're together with Jesus in this if we don't drift away in this process. What is man that you are mindful of? God the Father is mindful of mankind. He has a purpose for us that is far above the mission of angels, let alone of the deer and the sheep and the animals of the field and the beasts of, uh, of the field and the, the pets of the backyard. <laughs> far above all of that is man and the Son of Man, our captain. The age to come is going to be a brilliant, bright day of victory and conquest during the millennial rule and reign of Christ and then on into all of eternity. And he wants you and me to experience that together with him. Man and the Son of Man will have the world to come placed in subjection to them. Verse 8 of Hebrews 2. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. And you notice it's a small h because it's talking about humanity as a whole, but it happens to, in this case, include the Son of Man who is also equally God. <laughs> you put all things in subjection under mankind's feet. For in that he put all in subjection under man. God the Father put all things in subjection under <clears throat> humanity by intention. Not all will be there and not all will rule and reign. But that's God's intent. When he created us in the garden where it says that we are to be fruitful and multiply and do what? Have dominion over this earth, the plants, and the animals, and the world itself, we will reign forever and ever as overcomers, as Revelation 2 and 3 mentioned. I hope you're an overcomer. I hope you're becoming a true son, not just remaining as a child. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. That is a reminder to those who say the kingdom of God has already come. And we are experiencing the kingdom. And isn't the world wonderful and a better place because we're helping out the needy around us? Oh, no, that should be part of our suffering now as a servant that we might rule and reign together with Christ, with Christ, and under Christ someday. We don't see, do not yet see all things put under Him. But what do we see by the eye of faith in the promises? We see Jesus, yay, who was made a little lower than the angels. Why was he made temporarily a little lower than the angels? For the same reason that we experience suffering today. For the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor. We see Jesus in his prime leadership role. We don't just see Jesus dead on a cross. We see him alive from the dead and coming back to establish dominion over this world. We see Jesus. 
Do you see Jesus? I hope you do in the fullest sense of the word, not just in the become a child of God sense, okay? We see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Now we see him crowned with glory and honor. In our mind's eye, we see him in the role that he will assume someday and that he, by the grace of God, the Father, might taste death for everyone. He has done that, for it was fitting for Jesus, not for you and me, for whom are all things, by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, verse 10. Are you one of those sons? I hope you're becoming one of these sons being brought to glory. God's purpose was that the captain of our great salvation, which we should not neglect or drift away from, verse 10, the captain of that salvation, he was made perfect through sufferings, and you and I shall also be made, and use the word mature here, please, because none of us attain absolute sinless perfection in this life. But we can attain maturity in this life. For both he who sanctifies, who's that? Jesus. He makes us his children. He sets us apart for his possession and use. So both Jesus and those who are being, one at a time down through these ages, being sanctified, one after another, is being set apart for God's possession and use. Guess what? We're in this together with the captain of our faith. Are all of one. For which reason he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call us brethren. Hey, brethren. One denomination calls themselves the brethren. And whether they're living up to it or not, I don't know. But I think it's kind of a cool name, uh, the Brethren. Some of them call themselves Plymouth Brethren, because they uh, trace their roots to a guy named John Nelson Garvey way back. But let's not get controversial right now. Uh, in any case, Jesus calls us, is not ashamed to call us Brethren. Now, he may be ashamed of us at the judgment seat of Christ, for not living up to our potential, but he's not ashamed to at least call each and every one of us who has believed in him for everlasting life, brethren. <laughs> and he says, I will declare your name to my brethren. He has done that. He's declared it to me. He's declared it to you who believe in his name and you have heard what he has declared. Believe in me for everlasting life, and you have believed. He is not ashamed to call us brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. Jesus declares to his brethren the name and the person and the work of Yahweh God, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, kindness, truth. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. God has declared it, and he has declared it through Jesus, that we are God's brethren. And verse 13, and again, I will put my trust in him. The son put, put his trust in his father. We are invited to put our trust in our Savior, looking unto Jesus the captain or author of our faith. He's the captain or author, and he is also the one that brings it to completion, sometimes called the finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, you know what, we'll get on to verse 14 probably next week. Verse 12 and 13 is where we're going to wrap it up for today. Hebrews 2, 12 and 13. Once again, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. 
In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him, Jesus, in his Father, you and me, in Jesus. And again, here am I, Jesus will say, and proclaim with joy and delight. Here am I and the children, the brethren, whom God has given me. Okay, that's where we're at today. I hope you'll be back for more. And those who aren't here but see this online or uh, in the video, uh, God willing, if you can be with us or hopefully join us again uh, online or by DVD, we will um, continue through this uh, exposition in Hebrews chapter 2 and 3 and 4. Let's sing. We're going to sing Jesus, I have my cross have taken. And then Mike will wrap it up with a benediction following. We'll stand for the benediction, but let's remain seated for the singing. All right?
Amen.